Welcome to the 11th episode of our deep dive series on Canadian bank earnings. Today we're covering the second quarter 2023 bank earnings announcements, and we will return each quarter on this channel to update you on the latest financial results. My name is Daniel Stanley. I'm an ETF specialist at BMO Exchange Traded Funds, and I'm joined today by my friends and colleagues, Chris Heeks, Portfolio Manager for all of BMO's equity and multi-asset ETFs, as well as Sorab Mobahedi, Managing Director, Financials Research at BMO Capital Markets. Today, we're going to cover the recent bank earnings announcements and what they mean for investors in the Canadian economy, as well as looking at different ETF strategies that give you exposure to the Canadian banks. So without further ado, Chris and Sorab, thank you very much for taking the time to join me. We have a lot to talk about this time round. And Sorab, normally I start by asking about Canadian bank earnings, and we will get to that, I promise. But I have to take a different approach this morning because we recorded the last podcast on the morning of Thursday, March 9th, which was the day that Silicon Valley Bank experienced its first massive stock price decline, which ultimately led to it becoming the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. And as we all know, it didn't end there. There was Signature Bank, there was Credit Suisse and First Republic, uh, which were all hit. And frankly, regional banks remain under pressure to this day. So, Saurabh, can you talk to us about what does this tell us about the U.S. and Canadian banking system? Does it risk affecting the broader U.S. economy and other banking system? And Importantly, how has it impacted investor sentiment toward financials? Look, I think the quick answer, maybe to your last question, is it's not uh, accretive to investor sentiment, whether it uh, has to do with uh, Canadian banks or U.S. banks. But I think it also reminded us of a, of a couple of important factors that um, Having strong funding, liquidity, and capital position is, uh, is incredibly important to the viability of, uh, of a bank. And I think uh, when you look back at some of the large, you know, broad stroke metrics that we use, whether it's liquidity coverage ratio, net stable funding ratio, common equity capital ratio, the types of ratios that the regulators use for uh, for in, ensuring uh, a bank's balance sheet in Canada is both adequately liquid, funding levels high enough, and uh, capital levels sufficient, you know, we we were reminded of the strength of the Canadian banking system and, and the balance sheet um, as well. I think um, for us uh, as equity uh, kind of market watchers and investors. Uh, we also we feel a little bit worried that regulators don't usually like to let crises go to waste. And so there is a there's a potential here that uh, coming out of this, some of the regulatory remedies will be more punitive or um, you know higher requirements, whether it's capital, whether it's liquidity, um, and and the like, and so I think um, um, on the one hand we like the strength uh, of the balance sheets of the of the Canadian banks, but on the other hand we worry a little bit uh, about tougher, for example, capital requirements at a time that earnings growth may be also slowing, and the impact that will have on the ROE, return on equity, for uh, for equity investors, kind of. Um, let's say in the next, uh, in the foreseeable future. So um, first and foremost, reminded of the importance of the safety of the banks, but then secondarily thinking through the implications, especially as it pertains to return on equity on a go forward basis. That's great, sir. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that insight. Yeah, it, it seems like it reinforces the idea that the regulatory environment in Canada or the, the way they're regulated is very conservative. But at the other end, it, it, you know, tougher capital requirements may be down the road here. Chris, I want to turn over to you. Uh, ETFs are designed to track an index. Fundamentally, they have multiple layers of liquidity that make them ideal tools during times of stress in the market like what we've just experienced with U.S. regional banks. You know, Chris, we have roughly about a billion dollars in assets under management in ZUB, ZBK, which are the uh, 
hedged and unhedged BMO Equal Weight U.S. Banks Index ETF. Can you talk about ZUB, ZBK's exposure to the regional banks? Did it change? How did the ETFs perform over the last quarter? And, and was there noticeable change in things like tracking error and trading volumes? I, and I guess to summarize it, Chris, I've thrown a lot at you, but in other words, did the ETF pass the stress test? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think they definitely did. Let's you know start with the uh, the volume aspect of ETF, which is which is pretty interesting. Um, but uh, the general trend is, you know, and not just re regards to banking, but in general, you know, as volatility increases, you tend to see ETF usage increase. I think it's for a couple reasons. Um, you know, as volatility increases, uh, there's a certain amount of investors who like to participate in what's happening. And the ETFs can offer kind of a one ticket solution to put on and take off exposure as, as investors want to do that. Uh, but the other thing is they can act as a price discovery vehicle. And we've seen this multiple times, um, you know, maybe more recently in COVID where, where bonds, individual bonds weren't trading so much, but bond ETFs were trading and can act as a source of price discovery. So, yeah, we definitely saw that in this uh, kind of recent banking crisis. Uh, the volumes of our ETFs um, that you mentioned were kind of 4x, 5x, their typical trading volumes. And, you know, there, so it was quite a liquid trading market for, for investors to either take on or, or put, take off or put on exposure, you know, as, as they needed. You know, with regards to those ETFs, the other added thing was uh, they were actually going through a rebalance. So those are equal weighted re ETFs and they rebalance twice a year just to reset that equal weight. And, and also, you know, observe the health of the underlying companies as well. Uh, so it was actually rebalancing in March as well. So that was that was another, um, you know, kind of added dynamic in the market. Now, the way those ETFs work is a bank has to be uh, 10 billion market cap or greater to get into the index. And to stay in the index, it had to be 7.5 billion uh or greater so if it was already an index constituent so you know what we saw there is as the bank price declined and and, and really you know to the mention on performance like it was approximately a 25 percent decline obviously more heavy in in the regionals and in certain regionals in particular uh but it actually afforded the fund a, a, actually a good opportunity to reset uh because some of those smaller regionals actually ended up getting rebalanced out of the portfolio so, um, you know, like you mentioned, Silicon Valley obviously was deleted as, as it uh, as it failed. But we were also able to take out three banks, uh, two of which later failed. But we were able to take out three three other banks that were marginal. So the two that ended up failing as well were First Republic and Signature. We were able to remove those prior to uh, prior to them failing. And then we removed Western Alliance as well based on the market cap. So, uh, you know, provided the uh, funds a, a good opportunity to rebalance and naturally now has skewed the weight in those E2 ETFs to more of a, uh, you know, money center bank or, or large cap bank, if you will, and away, uh, away from the regionals. Uh, it was about a 55%, uh, 45%, um, you know, kind of large cap versus regional. Now, now it's about two thirds, one third. So two thirds large cap. So uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, better place. And if large cap banks continued to win, as 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 they may well do, you know, if if clients are concerned about the health of smaller regionals, you know, could be good good positioning going forward. But yeah, overall, I think past the stress test, and 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 now at this point going forward, you know, investors can be um, you know uh, confident that they're going to deliver the exposure they intend to. That's great to hear. Yeah, you know, we, we often talk about our fixed income ETFs and how, how they're important tools during times of stress in the market. So it's nice to see uh, how well the equity uh, focused ETFs work during these times of, <clears throat> excuse me, during these times of stress as well. So I want to come back to you. Uh, let's get to the Canadian bank earnings that uh, we didn't talk about on the first question. You know, last quarter, I think it was five of the six uh, Canadian banks beat their expectations. This time around, there seemed to be Few more headwinds, including the uh, you know the concern that inflation isn't yet under uh, under control, the potential for higher rates, which was <laughs> reinforced this week with the Bank of Canada's move, rising cost, risk of recession, a lot out there. With that as the backdrop, how how did the banks do in Q2, and uh, how did the uh, markets react, Sarah? 
Okay, well, um, uh, before I get to the to the market reaction, let's just kind of get our bearings straight. The big six uh, banks in Canada, they reported operating net income after tax earnings of about $13.7 billion in the quarter. Um, that was down about 9% from a year ago this quarter. Um, a year ago this quarter, they were closer to $15.1 billion. Now, I think one of the big differences this quarter versus a year ago was uh, the credit cost line. Just, just uh, to, again, to benchmark ourselves properly, uh, we were at an abnormally low credit provision line of basically two basis points a year ago this quarter. Obviously, cost of goods sold in banking, which puts balance sheet out, is credit costs and a two basis point loss rate. It was just is unrealistic, but it was a reflection of uh, the extent of reserving that had gone in in response to the COVID and the pandemic and how, how much of those reserves can have been retained. So this quarter, the one that ended, the credit cost ratio was closer to 29 basis points up from two basis points. So that will be a very large, if you will, a bit of an uh, earnings headwind or a revenue headwind. And probably a through the cycle number, given the mix of the uh, loan book and, and the like, is more like a 35 basis point. So there's still some more room for this 29 basis points to kind of grind higher. Um, so when you look at the quarter, um, uh, five, if last quarter, five of the big six banks missed, I'd say this quarter, or, or uh, beat, I'd say this quarter, five of the big six missed. And I think in an, in an environment, and I do think we are in an environment still, it, it was exacerbated by the Silicon Valley banking crisis that we talked about. I think investor sentiment is um, perhaps a bit tired towards the banking space. And I think investors are taking a more patient uh, wait and see approach. And so I think on days of reporting, um, maybe the activity is more driven by, um, uh, you know, by quants and um, um, uh, systems trading as opposed to individuals. And I think uh, when there is a miss, it gets reflected in the stock with a negative reaction. And when there's a beat, it gets reflected in the stock with a positive reaction. I don't think fundamentally it was a thesis altering quarter, though, when you think about the outlook for the banks, as you've talked about, as we all know, higher rates, uh, slower economic activity, inflation. I mean, these are all contributing to a tougher economic environment. And banks are levered plays on the economy. So you would expect sentiment towards banks to continue to weigh a little bit until our outlook on a on a more robust or a better economic uh, recovery uh, and growth kind of reiterate. So I think at a time where we are in a bit of a more difficult, more subdued economic outlook, um, where credit costs are going to be eating away at some of the revenues, where some of the benefits of rate hikes are now going to have probably a bit of a negative feedback loop insofar as bank funding costs will have to reflect some of those higher rates for uh, you know some of the lazier depositors who may not move for the first 10 or 50 uh, or 100 or 200 basis points of rate increases, but will certainly move when you're in the four, four and a half percent range. Um, I think that, is, and then of course uh, the the banking crisis that that was brought about by Silicon Valley probably meant credit spreads for all of the banks kind of widened a little bit as well. So funding costs are drifting higher. I think the margins are going to get a little bit more squeezed, and I think in a slower economic activity or in a slower economy, you'll have a reduction in loan demand. So there are probably some revenue headwinds here. So the banks will obviously try and. Uh, offset those with a with a more intent focus on things that they, that are within their control we think expenses will be part of that narrative uh, but broadly speaking uh, our conclusion here is that um, given this economic outlook uh, which again i don't think there was anything new this quarter it was just exacerbated by the silicon valley uh, situation i think 
I think um, we're looking for earnings, organic earnings growth to be very flattish. <laughs> so I think the banks will be able to manage to EPS growth in 23, I think probably organically, more or less in line with 22. And, and uh, you know, given the sort of assumptions we have around the operating environment, again, unless there's been an acquisition, we think 24 EPS may more or less look like 23 EPS. And so I think you're going to be looking at a period potentially where you've got three years of no EPS growth or nominal EPS growth. And so I think that is a little bit, uh, um, um, you know, that obviously weighs on your outlook from a ratings perspective. It probably is not additive from a sentiment perspective. And and uh, the dividend yields are strong and uh, obviously a key contributor to the total returns that we have for the banks or assumptions and targets we have for the banks. But I also think they're getting a run for their money with risk-free rates basically kind of drifting a little bit higher. So I think we're in a bit of a tricky uh, part for the for the banks. And I think what we are looking for to get a little bit more, uh, if you will, um, uh, pulled up or to have sentiment, I think, turn more positive is indications that the top line growth, that revenue line is going to drive growth as opposed to the expense line. And so there, I think we are very, uh, maybe in a self-serving way, waiting for the capital markets businesses to show signs of life. We're looking for, you know, whether it's investment banking, new issue activity, wealth businesses and the like that are basically fee driven as opposed to spread dependent to uh, to drive, if you will, the, that revenue growth. And I think banks that are probably more levered to those sorts of revenue streams Will, will then benefit in the first instance, I think from funds flow and positive uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, so that maybe is a bit of a long-winded answer to your question, but I think it puts it into some context as to where we're coming from, where were we this quarter, and probably where we're headed over the next, call it uh, four to six quarters. Uh, that's perfect, Sir Abin. Next couple of calls, we'll, we'll, what's that top line revenue? What's it look like versus the expenses? We'll, we'll, we'll keep tabs on that to look for that turning point for sure. Um, good segue into a question for you, Chris, because Sorab mentioned you know, the initial reaction uh, to the stock prices, which did seem pretty volatile. I, if memory serves me, stocks were sort of down three, 4% on, on some of the reactions to the earnings. Um, Chris, ETFs are fantastic tools to kind of take a step back and, and, and look at sector pricing behavior. How has ZEB, the BMO Equal Weight Bank Index ETF, performed just in general and in relation to ZBK and ZUB? And what about the ETFs that write call options on the Canadian U.S. banks? How, how have they generally performed over that uh, this past quarter? Yeah, so certainly uh, a lot better than the U.S. banks. So we'll start with a good news story there. Uh, you know, kind of the last three months, Canadian banks are kind of down four-ish percent. And like you said, a lot of that, you know, some of that came from, uh, you know, the crisis and a little bit of the, you know, uh, missing on earnings, uh, being a bit of a headwind. Uh, but again, you know, in the global financial landscape, you know, Canadian banks, again, uh, have, you know, proven to, proven to, uh, you know, have better, much better relative performance in times of kind of banking crisis, um, you know, better than Europe as well, and, and certainly better than the US. Uh, so, you know, I think what's, you know, it, what's interesting is certainly the dividend yields are, are attractive, as Saurabh mentioned. I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, near term concern, um, you know, from the macro side as well. Um, you know, you're looking at potential uh, slowdowns in the second half or or perhaps that recession that's, you know, talked about so much is getting pushed off into 2024. Uh, but there are investor concerns. So I think that has weighed on banks and, and uh, you know, contributed to them uh, trading more sideways. Uh, you know, on the flow side, which is interesting. And, you know, I think, you know, personally, I'm more always more kind of uh, <clears throat> comfortable recommending things on a kind of a three to five year time basis. If, if investors can look out that far, you know, I think people are interested in responding to some of the levels here um, on kind of that ability to look through a little bit of the cycle. We've seen about 850 million in, in positive flows come into ZEB um, this year. So there's certainly, uh, you know, there's a lot of investor interest. Um, and then, yeah, maybe just, you know, in terms of the cover calls. So ZWB is our, our BMO Canadian 
uh, cover call bank ETF. And then we've got the ZWK in the US, which is our BMO US uh, bank cover call uh, ETF. Um, you know, pro, you know that, that that's been interesting because you know with this associated volatility, and certainly in the U.S., there's you know very you know been a, quite a lot of volatility over the quarter. You know that ability to turn the volatility into an extra income stream has been beneficial. So you've seen a little bit of outperformance of the ZWB in Canada versus the ZEB, and to the extent perhaps banks go sideways, um, you know, kind of over the next few months, you know that can be accretive to a strategy like ZWB on a relative basis. Uh, ZWK, I'll just mention that, um, you know, it has a, has a little bit different exposure than the index ETFs that we were mentioning before, the ZBK and the ZUB. Um, it doesn't track that index, although it certainly looks to that index as a, um, call it a, um, you know, selection set. Uh, but that fund, you know, in the, in the preference to go a little more large cap has reduced a little bit of the weight to regionals. It's also added Morgan Stanley, which is, you know, not more of a more of a broker than a bank, but, you know, I think fits in the large cap objectives of the fund. So we've added, you know, a little more weight to the larger caps. So uh, so so that one, you know, can benefit from, again, that trend to large cap and, and can also benefit from the option volatility. So um, so investors can see, you know, a little bit of price divergence there, depending on how regionals do versus large caps going forward. But, uh, you know, those are the, some of the things you can look at, look at, but, you know, again, I think, uh, you know, looking and looking at it from a two, three, four, five, you know, five year time horizon, um, you know, it could prove to be an interesting, uh, entry opportunity because certainly there's a little bit of negativity on the space overall and, and, uh, but there's some attractive, you know, uh, you know, there's been some resilience with earnings in Canada and the attractive dividend yield are, are reasons investors may consider them. Yeah, you've got a really interesting perspective, Chris. I mean, to see the the flows come in, that 850 million, that's a big number. And and the trading volumes as well on ZEB, how much they've gone up is very, very impressive. It speaks volumes of the the general popularity of Canadian banks to, to Canadian investors. Um, Saurabh, I want to come over to you. Uh, prior to our last call, and we, we talked about this, it was announced that uh, TD's uh, planned merger with First Horizon and that it wasn't going to meet regulatory approval prior to that key deadline. And then on May 4th, TD announced that it was in fact terminating that merger altogether. Um, talk to us about this. Like, Is this going to be a big financial hit for TD or is this more of a, sort of a reputational issue for TD at this point? Um, you know, um, we, we talk about it. Banks are obviously regulated businesses. So staying on the right side of the regulator is incredibly important. I think from a TD perspective, you know, they can't really divulge too much about the details of the, of the matter. These are obviously private. And uh, but what we care about is what are the implications of it? Okay, so we're we're less focused on what happened, uh, but more interested in what now has to happen to be able to participate, probably in what will end up being a consolidation era for the US banking space. We can cover that on another call, but, but what I think it means for TD is a, an important uh, growth vector for them is to be able to continue to expand in the US. Uh, you can, it sounds like they will be able to continue to do this still organically, for example, by opening up new branches and the like, but, and maybe even deploying capital in, in circumstances other than, other than acquiring depository institutions. Um, but if we understand the nature, the broad nature of the issue, it is not. It is obviously reputationally damaging insofar as they were unable to close a bank deal, and so likely sellers will probably think twice before they agree to to an acquisition by TD, at least for the for the foreseeable future. It also probably has meant that they have a bit of a thicker file, let's say, with the with the regulator for the next time they they want to go through. The good news is once you get this cleaned up. Uh, then you probably have a clean bill of health for some some time to come. Uh, the bad news is it's going to take time 
to clean this up. So it's not a situation of writing a check, you know, or a, for a fine or a penalty or something like that. And, you know, I think it will take a little bit of, it will take effort on the part of the bank, probably measured in, in two to three year type time frame to clean up the matter to the regulator's satisfaction before they could actually get a regulatory clean bill of health. Uh, and then in a meaningful way, deploy that capital, uh, not in wealth acquisitions or insurance acquisitions or even investment banking type acquisitions where there are no real synergies, but in deposit ta depository taking institutions and bank acquisitions in the US where the real synergies would exist with them. So, um, you know, for us as equity investors, there's obviously some, some uncertainty, more details I'm sure over time around the implications of this will will be disclosed by by the management but for the time being what we know is it's going to cost based on our own research it's going to cost some money yet to be quantified by the by management team how much and some time yet to be quantified by the management team how long before the issues can be resolved and put behind them we've made that adjustment by basically increasing the discount rate we use in evaluating uh, TD. So uh, we've lowered our basically evaluation multiple on it. There, there is some capital there, no doubt. And our target price, for example, would reflect the, the benefit of that capital, but also reflect the lack of deployability of that capital. To me, it feels like that capital is sitting in an escrow account at the lawyer's office. You know, we weren't able to get the house, house purchase done the capital has not vaporized, but I'm not sure if we could easily go buy another house uh, just right away. We have some issues to resolve. That's how I think about the TD issue right now. And it's it's interesting, sir. I mean, we've, we've this is our 11th uh, podcast, and we've talked about the risks of inorganic acquisitions. And uh, you know, I, I guess it speaks volumes that it took 11 podcasts to get to the first uh, actual risk uh, to see it in real life. So that's probably a good thing about the Canadian banks. We don't get ourselves into these situations often. So, okay, guys, there there was a lot that happened in the last quarter, and I was trying to figure out how, how, what's the best last question. There's so many different topics, and I, and I wanted to change it up for this one with one final lightning round question. I'm going to ask Chris, you to start, and then Sorab to close off. Um, looking at everything that happened in the last quarter, you guys eat, sleep, breathe, everything to do with banks and the financial markets. Looking back at everything that happened, what's that one thing that sort of surprised you the most and why? Chris, start with you. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the banking crisis certainly was a surprise, uh, you know, but, um, you know, perhaps we should expect something to to volatility with you know higher interest rates much higher than we've seen so that that was a surprise but for me i think the one that stood out and kind of a little more broader market themed was the resurgence of technology this year um, technology severely underperformed last year but it has come back with a vengeance this year and if you look at the kind of more recent news you know nvidia has been a company in the news that's had um you know massive price appreciation and so the, the 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 surprise to me is ai and uh the the, the way you know and the the ferocity which ai and the conversation around ai has come into the market and so you know that's sort of a surprise to me and then interested to see how that plays out not just in technology but in banking uh, companies and and other areas of our life obviously so that's that's been the big uh, surprise for me on the quarter what what yeah. i would say maybe i would maybe i would kind of point point out two surprises. I do agree with uh, with the observation that the Silicon Valley banking crisis was a bit of a surprise, especially because it's only been, I don't know, 10 or 12 years uh, since we had the global banking crisis. Lots of good regulation came out of that, but I think in the end, it probably is not so much the regulation, but the application of that regulation or lack of application of that regulation, maybe in the context of some of these smaller uh, U.S. regional banks, um, but also a reminder uh, that uh, the system is probably as uh, strong as its weakest link, right? And that these are incredibly, uh, banks are confidence games. Uh, depositors can have bank runs and maybe in the spirit of uh, the observation on tech, the impact of technology, this was probably a social media bank run. The first one we've seen, uh, unlike the ones we'd seen uh, in the past. So that would be the negative. But I would say the positive, 
perhaps the positive is the resiliency of the consumer in Canada, right? I think that is probably uh, a surprise, the, the, uh, the ability to continue to absorb these higher rates, for example, when it comes to mortgage payments, and maybe there is a shoe to drop, but uh, the, the consumer has been incredibly resilient, and probably the economy from an, from an employment perspective has been a pleasant uh, uh, surprise as well. So those would be my kind of observations. I don't know if I would have expected much different in one quarter from an, from an economy perspective, but I wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have expected that we would be needing another Bank of Canada rate hike like we had this week. So that's probably, you know, that it probably culminates in that and we'll see what the f- future holds, but it feels like probably higher rates may be s- still uh, required. So we'll see. I, I think I, that, that's a great way to, I mean, I, for me, the surprise was exactly that, how we've withstood everything that seems to be thrown at us in, in the last quarter. Uh, and, and frankly, in the last three years, it's a pretty resilient economy. And Chris, to your point, uh, the applicability of technology to the financial, uh, to the, to the uh, banking sector is going to be very, very interesting going forward and, and probably will play a much bigger role, I think, than we all think. Uh, Chris, Sorab. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to remind the audience that you guys can get exposure to the Canadian banks via ZEB, which is our BMO Equal Weight Bank Index ETF. Uh, you can get exposure to the U.S. banks via ZUB, ZBK, which are the BMO Equal Weight U.S. Banks Index ETF. The first one is hedged, but the second one is unhedged. Uh, if you have any questions, please visit the ETF Center at bmoetfs.com. That's bmoetfs.com. Uh, that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much for tuning in. Please join us in mid September for the next update on Canadian banks. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.